Hey everybody, KC here. So I just finished a conversation with Vivek Shankaran, who is the CEO of Albertsons. And this is part of my morning news beating conversation series, key to the fact that we're celebrating our 20th anniversary around here. And I think this is a really interesting conversation. First of all, we talked a lot about where he was 20 years ago and how his definition of innovation has changed over that period of time. We talked about how he, having moved from the world of consulting to CPG, now to retail, how that has affected the way he thinks about innovation. We talked about leadership, but I really want you to hang around to the end because one of the things we talked about was his first job um, out of engineering school and what he did and wh why that was important. And the metaphor that he offers, I think, is so powerful that it's something that everybody needs to think about. Because what it really comes down to is the idea that in great retail, you're not just selling stuff, but you're enabling people to live the lives they want to live or they aspire to live, right? And that has to do whether you're selling food or clothing or furniture, or whatever it happens to be. You're enabling people to live the lives they either want to live or aspire to live. And that's incredibly powerful. It's not just about transactions. We talk a lot about that at the end. Anyway, that's uh, this edition of Morning News Beating Conversation. Uh, Vivek Shankaran, CEO of Albertsons. I hope you enjoy. Well, Vivek Shankaran, welcome to Morning News Beat. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. Delighted to be here with you. So since we're doing this in the context of Morning News Beat's uh, 20th anniversary, uh, I'm curious, 20 years ago, where were you? First, congratulations on 20 years. That's pretty awesome. It uh, is. Yeah. Uh, 20 years ago, I was a partner in a consulting firm uh, in Detroit mm -hmm. and doing, doing many, many things. But the only relationship I had with food was eating it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So... In the twenty, in those twenty years, then you moved from being in the consulting business from to being in CPG, and yes. now in retail. I don't yes. think I'm missing a, a a stop, am I? You're right. And, but also, in the last twenty years, a lot of things have changed, right? I mean, we, I mean, in terms of technology, retail innovation, things like that. So I'm curious, how is your thinking about about first of all innovation changed in that period of time? And is it, I'm, I'm curious if it is, has it changed more because it, it's been 20 years or changed because you've gotten different perspectives on the, on the industry based on where you were? I think it's a little bit of both or many other things too. Um, so let me begin though, if I, if I stay in the world of food, right, um, Kevin, let me start there. Um, think about America today and the diversity in America today from 20 years ago. Um, it's not, if you were going to go to dinner tonight on Friday, you probably are thinking about choices like, do I want to go to uh, Tapas place or do I want to go Korean or do I want to go Moroccan? And I mean, there's so many choices. So I think food in, food in America has become um, so much more exciting and different in terms of choices people have. Um, and so that has driven a lot of how we think about innovation and choices we need to provide, number one. Right. The second thing is technology and data. Uh, that has changed so dramatically in the two last 20 years and access to technology and data, not just for us, but for the customer. Uh, and that has driven uh, a lot of choices we need to make in innovation. And the most important change in my mind is uh, speed. You know, it used to be uh, it, it used to be that back then you people, a lot of people focused on these big and bold innovations. I don't think you can do that anymore. You know, being, you don't know what's going to be big. You, you probably know what's going to be bold. You don't know what's going to be big. So now we are all in the mode of doing something quickly, trying it out and doubling up on that, what's working and pulling back on what's not working. And so I think it's a combination of all of these, at least three of these forces in my, my observation that have come together to change the nature of innovation. Kevin. Do you think that that is also going to impact um, it, format innovation going forward in the sense that, um, you know, so much of stores, and this has been a bugaboo of mine for probably close to 20 years on Morning Newsbeat, which is that so much of store, traditional store formats um, are, are dedicated to products that are not necessarily differentiated, right? 
Now that's that has that has ebbed and flowed over those twenty years, um, but especially now with technology, uh, with the ability to um, to shop for certain things digitally, where it doesn't matter whether or not you're in the store, um, and then reserving the store format. Not in every case, not in every market, not for every person, but dedicating more of the store for the differentiated products. Correct. Do you think that is the kind of? I, I mean, do you think that's the kind of change we're going to see in the next, I don't know, six, I want to say six, six years, it could be six months, it could be six weeks, the way things are changing these days. You, you're onto something. I, I, uh, I don't know if it's going to fundamentally change the real estate format itself, because there's plenty, we have, we've all got a lot of a big install base. But what we put money into, my opinion will change. So if you take a store, uh, you know, if I was to simplify it, Kevin, there's three three pieces to it. One of our a, a classic store like ours. One is a part of the store which is highly sensory, and we want it to be that way. You know, your I mean, it's about food. You go in, you see wonderful colors, you smell the bakery, um, you're tasting things, you're touching and feeling things. We want that sensory experience. At least, at least before COVID. And oh, yeah, before COVID. COVID. <laughs> you're right, but you know, there are many parts of the store where that's coming back. You can a country where you can go in and. There's a wonderful salad bar or a, a, a bar with Chinese food or get freshly made wings. You can do all of that. And we think that that, that has to be central to defining a store experience for somebody. There's a second part of it, which is where you, where, what you're referring to is the center store. You're right, it's hard to differentiate there, but there it's about making things really easy for the shopper. And technology allows you to make it easy for the shopper. If she wants it delivered or brought to the car, we can make it easy. Even if she's navigating the store or he's navigating the store, we can make it easy, right? So there's technology plays a role. And then the third part of the store is checkout. There too, we think there's one of two experiences. One is we want a friendly experience. So you remember a, a friendly, somebody saying hi to you, or we want it to be a simple, easy experience where you remember nothing about it. And both those are both and and both both of those, by the way, can be technology enabled. And so I do think, but it's if you have a store, it's going to continue to center back on that sensory side of it, which is a big part of the store, especially for someone like us. Yeah, it's interesting that you're talking about the checkout because it, it, it seems to me that in so many ways, because everybody talks about Amazon Go, right? Everybody talks about checkout free, and clearly not everybody's going to be able to do it, and not every store is going to be able to have it. But the alternative, it seems to me, is making something differentiating out of the checkout experience so it's not the worst part of the shopping experience, which in many stores, I'm not talking about you guys, but in many stores it is, right? Even if you have a great shopping experience, it ends with you getting online and handing over money to somebody. It's never great. And so it seems to me that's a, that's a, that needs to be a real focus for a lot of stores. Yes, it's never great if you have to wait, right? So it's got to be quick. Um, it's 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 better. It can be actually pleasant if the when you have that interaction, it's a pleasant experience, a conversation. I know it's not it's not the more, most important conversation you may have in that day, but it's a, a meaningful moment with somebody, and you have an exchange that helps. Um, uh, it doesn't help if that exchange is bad. So what we work on is making sure it's fast and make sure that people are friendly. Or you have other options where you don't see a person at all and it, you scan your 10 items and go away, right? And both those, Kevin, I think are going to be part of the future. Do you, um, and what you're just describing is a, a place of friction in a lot of stores. Yes. Is removing friction from the shopping experience, from the moment you pull into the parking lot to the moment you go back to the parking lot and maybe beyond or beyond, even at home to the online experience is removing friction sort of a, uh, is that a high priority for you guys? It's an excellent word, excellent choice of words. Yes, friction, removing friction matters. Here's why, you know, let's take, uh, let's take a delivery as an example. Forget the store for a second. Imagine delivering something at home. Um, I always remind people that if you buy a refrigerator, you do that once every 10 years, maybe, you know, um, five years if you got unlucky and had to replace it. You're willing to wait four hours, wouldn't you? I mean, the refrigerator better be the right one. You want it installed the right way. It's a big deal. I mean, you spent a few grand on that refrigerator. Now, 
if you're buying groceries, you're buying it three times a week, Kevin, you know, um, and, and it's part of your daily, that's what you do. Why would you wait? Why would you wait two hours even? You know, so I think you're going to find that's friction in my mind and in our minds. And so we want to keep reducing that friction. When you pull up to uh, for drive up and go, uh, wait time, there's friction. So we want to rush to your car. We're averaging three minutes to put it in your car. Uh, and it's the same philosophy in a store. We want to keep reducing your friction to shop. The whole checkout conversation that we had, a prepared meal that you can take home and put in the oven and have a great meal in 15 minutes, salmon and asparagus, okay? That was cut in the store that morning. So we keep thinking about reducing friction, um, but it's also focused on making, you can, another way to think about it is making things easier and more convenient for customers on all aspects of their interaction. Do you think that friction and speed are necessarily synonyms in this case? We've been having a conversation over the last week or so on Morning Newsbeat about the whole notion of speed. Instacart says they're going to try 15 minute delivery. And in, in most cases, you would have to defy the laws of physics to do 15 minute delivery. And I keep, I, I think sometimes that the industry does equate speed with friction. And I don't think they're necessarily the same thing. Am I wrong it's on a, that? I'm thinking about it, but you know, there are aspects of quality that can create friction too, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about it, it's nothing to do with speed, but if I'm out of stock for you, I just created friction for you as a customer because I have to make you redo something right. or come up with an alternative plan. Um, if, if my produce doesn't last long enough in your refrigerator for you, I've just created friction. friction. So I think speed is one component of it. Uh, making things uh, remove, quality could be another component of it. Uh, providing information to you so you can solve what you want to do uh, the three nights of this week for dinner, right? That could also remove friction. Another way to think about it, some, some of my team use, they use an interesting word. They talk, talk about cognitive load, right? How can I keep reducing, uh, making things easier for you just from having to think about something as simple as food that you do four times, six times a day? Yeah, well, I think that that's, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's a huge deal. The idea of, of dealing with that issue that, that customers are constantly dealing with whether it's through auto replenishment at the consumer level, not for not the store level, but at the consumer level, whether it's figuring out ways to use data to understand what people want and don't want, and then being able to customize offers. I mean, it seems to me that that's, it remains a challenge for most retailers to, to use that data in the most efficient and effective way. Yes, and, and, but that's, it's a challenge that's worth undertaking mm -hmm. and pursuing because one, the data becomes more and more available. Mm -hmm. Two, uh, we have our customers are getting more digitally engaged. That's a beautiful sweet spot, right? When they're digitally engaged and you, are, you have more and more data available and the analytical capabilities are going up, then you come back with meaningful solutions for that customer. Um, and you can start, start segmenting it much more precisely for that customer. So I, I think it's, it's a worthy pursuit, again, in the spirit of reducing friction um, and uh, making things easier uh, for that customer. So how do you think about, uh, to the I'm sure you do, I was going to say to the extent that you think about it, but how do you think about leadership in that in, within this, this sort of cauldron, if you will, in terms of, I mean, you've got various different businesses, you've got different components of different businesses, you've got all this technology, you've got hundreds of thousands of employees all over the country, some of which are in your backyard in Boise and some of whom are in Massachusetts um, or further away than that, perhaps. Um, how do you... How do you approach leadership in terms of in terms of in terms of creating a narrative for the company and in terms of messaging? Yeah, Kevin, I um, uh, I'm always learning on that front, right? By and I don't think that journey ever ends. And I've had to adapt uh, what I do as a leader for the company that we are as the Albertsons companies. And so, just as a little bit of context. 
you know, when the companies were brought together, uh, when Albertsons and Safeway came together, the, the heritage of this company is that we want to allow for great ownership at the, at the front line. Mm -hmm. at the store level. And then let's aggregate from there because we never want to lose ownership at the store level. Uh, and so uh, I was lucky enough to inherit a company with that kind of a mindset, um, the sense of local ownership. So my challenge was, okay, that's great. So how do you leverage some scale? Okay. And so we try to always find a way to balance in our company, this notion of being locally great and nationally strong. And, and our roles as leaders is to find ways to bring those nationally strong components to that front line so that they can get things done faster, cheaper, better uh, for that customer. The second aspect in leadership that I'll say, uh, let's go back to your 20 years ago, That's a, because that's a good, a good frame, I think. If you go back, I remember at a time, there were times when we would do, as a consultant, we would do three, five-year strategies, Kevin, and we'll say do it, execute it, we'll come back and refresh it in three years, you know. I'd be nuts to put a three-year strategy and just stick with it because the game changes every three months. We have to learn to zig and zag. So I think as a leader today, you just have to be a much better listener. You just have to know that what, what I worry about a lot is at what point am I starting to drink my own Kool-Aid, you know. And I've got to be able to listen and got to be able to say, yeah, we were going down path A, time to steer it a little bit this way, steer it a little bit that way, and be a lot more nimble. Um, and I think that, that, that helps in our market, and it's helped in particular uh, with what's been happening over the last two years. Do you think that, um, that just because of the pace of change, whether it's and consumer trends and all the things that sort of create the environment in which you are, uh, your company exists, does Albertsons, you think to yourself that Albertsons, forget about the three, year, five, year, three to five year plan, but that Albertsons is on a path that at some point in the future, it will be, a, it has to be, it will or has to be a different kind of company just because of the, the way consumers consume product, whether it's TV shows, movies, or buy Oreos or cornflakes, that has changed so dramatically and that and, and that change was accelerated over the last two years. Yes, uh, there's no question about it. And I, it, there are going to be aspects of the Albertsons companies which will be essential to that future. Um, the stores that we have, the proximity of the stores to where people live, the assortment that we have, the ability to complete the shop, et cetera, those will remain. I think what will continue to change is the technology enablement of everything we do starting with how we work with our customer and making sure that that customer is digitally engaged and, and digitally enabling every piece of the business behind that. The use of data to make that more efficient and effective. Those are aspects that will continue to change. I, I don't know where it goes. That's the beautiful thing about this, right? I think, frankly, I think despite everything we're seeing there, we're still all collectively in the very early days of technology enabling grocery. So I wanna go back to the leadership question for a second. How do you lead in such a way that enables innovation to happen throughout the organization? And I'm not, I don't. I guess what I mean is, how do you institutionalize innovation? And that sounds like it's a it, it, that's that's contradictory. But how do you get an organization to think innovatively? I mean, I, my observation has been that a lot of companies got so much more innovative during the past twenty months or so because they didn't think about it as innovation. They thought about it as we got to just to survive. So we got to make all these changes. And so they didn't do the things that normally happen with innovation, which is they create a committee and then they do a focus group and then they chop, huh. you know, they work, right. And then they workshop it and they test it and they test it. And by the time they actually do it, it may have lost all its momentum. That didn't happen over the last 20 months at most organizations that are, that have been successful. How do you, I mean, do you think it's worth kind of making, creating an organization in which that is the way things or innovation is always approached? And then how do you lead that? Yes, I, uh, that, let's go back to, let's go back to March, 2020, right? When the, when the pandemic was upon us, none of us had pattern recognition because we were not around for the last one, uh, last big one, at least. Uh, there was no, there was no uh, confirmed logic on what we need to do. Um, there was no scientific basis for exactly at that time on what we needed to do. 
Um, and so what's fascinating is at that time, we asked ourselves only two questions. If I was to come back, what does it take to keep customers safe? And what does it take to, to keep our associates safe? And if we had an idea, we tried it. It was beautiful, Kevin. We tried it the same day. We didn't debate it. We, didn't, we just tried it. And ideas that worked, we kept. Ideas that didn't, we killed. And then more ideas came on. But it was so focused on what matters to the customer and the associate. We've tried to preserve that. I think in my, my learning has been, if you can preserve, preserve uh, curiosity on what matters to the customer and the associate, and then you can allow for some experimentation and then be brutal about what you're going to stop and what you're going to amplify. My sense is it creates magic. And we're doing that in many, many different parts of the business. I worry sometimes there's this always this desire to creep back to an old way. And part of my, my, my obligation is to find a way we, we don't do that. Um, and, but that's the combination at least I've learned over the last couple of years. I think that's huge though, in the sense that, I mean, I've talked to a lot of business leaders who have said, um, that, oh God, I can't wait for things to get back to the way things were. And, I'm, and my reaction is, well, I think that's the wrong thing to think about, I think. I mean, it's better to, things are never going back. I mean, then things never go back. For better or for worse, things never go back to where they were. And I think, I think effective leaders have to constantly be looking to say, okay, and listening, as you said before, and thinking about what comes next. And, and living in this, what we've had over the last two years is this high degree of uncertainty. And, and we've been comfortable with it. Uh, and I think that we need to find a way to sustain that environment. And if you ask yourself, truly ask yourself, are you really certain about which way e-commerce is going or which way technology? You don't know. We just don't have that anxiety that came with the pandemic. It'd be great to retain some degree of anxiety. I think it'll allow this innovation we've talked about. Was it Andy Grove of Intel who said paranoia is a, it can be a positive emotion? I mean, in correct. the sense that it keeps you, it does keep you on your toe. <laughs> that is correct. Yeah. yeah. So I, really, you've been very generous with your time. And I really appreciate it. I, I have one last question. I may have another one, but I, the last yes. question I'm thinking that I want to ask you is to go back even before 20 years. My understanding is that when, that your first job out of engineering school did you fix printers or copiers on the side of the road in, in India? Yes, sir. Did I, do I understand that correctly? Explain yes, that business model to me. Yeah, no, no, yeah, it's fascinating. So I, I joined Xerox. Um, it was called Modi Xerox. It was a joint venture with a company in India. And I was a service engineer. So I had a motorcycle and I'd go fix photocopiers. Um, that's what I did. And in India back then, I don't know if it's still, I bet it's still that way. Uh, if you were a family, you would you would lease a photocopier or two, and you'd set up shop on the roadside, you know, just a little bitty, small little uh, room, and you'd make copies for 10 paisa a copy at that time. And if your copier went down, you didn't make money that day. Think about that, okay? And so as a service engineer, I learned very, very quickly back then that you know, these are people's livelihoods. I'm not in the business of fixing a copier. I'm in the business of keeping livelihoods going. First of all, I got to imagine you'll never have a harder job than that. Yes. Number one, right? And whatever they throw at you today, you can always say to yourself, it's not going to be as hard as that was. But that's, I think what you just said to me crystallizes what the food industry has to, has to do in the sense that, right, how many, how many companies think of themselves, they build boxes and now they have, now they have trucks that go out to places, but they, 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 they're selling boxes and bags and cartons and things like that. And, but their real job is to feed people. And if you think of your job as being to feed people, I think you approach the notion of food retailing or quite frankly, even being in the restaurant business, you focus, you, you think differently about it because it becomes about that family or that single person or that couple sitting down having that meal. That's what it's about. It's not about, it's not about the transaction. It's not about, right? It's, a, it's about something different that I think has more to do with creating relationship with the shopper than it has to do with getting them to spend 50 cents more you know, twice a week 
yes. when they come into the store. Yes, just think about the last few weeks. We were around with family around food. Okay, think about our weekends. It's with friends and family around food. It's such a central part of what we do. Um, I think if the pandemic did anything around food and us, it just gave us a renewed sense of purpose, right? That we are, that not only are we as an important part of getting people together, but we're an important part of sustaining. And, and I, I'm so proud of the team for doing some incredible things over the last two years to make sure we serve that purpose. Um, not just to our customers, but also the communities that we operate in, Kevin. Um, and uh, there's nobody wants this pandemic again, and we want it to be behind us. Um, but for us, it was a catalyst uh, for many, many different things that we've done in our company. Okay. And this will be my last question. Sure. Does that mean that you think about being essential as a company differently than you did 22 months ago? Yes, and I want to use that term. I mean, remember, remember, we are, uh, we were, we are essential during the pandemic. That term was used when the pandemic was really right. widespread, and we had to stay open. Uh, but in a different sense, I think we are. We are. We want to be. We want to be uh, an important part of your life um, around the things you do with food and well-being. That's that's how we approach it. Yeah, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that in the sense that I think that that's, that's the question I think retailers need to think about, to think to themselves every day or ask themselves and have their people ask themselves every day, which is, how are we going to be essential to our customers? Because if you're, if you can't answer that question, then you're non-essential, which is to say disposable and somebody can compete with you really easily and beat you. That is correct. Yeah. That if you just stay with the stay as somebody who just delivers the ingredients yeah. and thinks about yourself that way, that's dangerous. Yeah. Well, Vivek Shankran, I, I really appreciate your time today. Um, it, this has been fascinating, and I, I wish you the best of luck. Have a great holiday, and I hope we get a chance to talk again down the road. Thank you, Kevin, and wish you another 20 fabulous years. Well, I don't know if I'll make 20, but I'll try and do some. All right. Anyway, take care. Thanks. Keep chatting.